Today I will talk about how mycoprotein is used, uh, which is produced from a fungi and is then turned into something which you probably better know as corn. So what a lot of people eat nowadays. And this has a very interesting production process, so that's part of the reason for talking about it. But also partly because I'm based at Newcastle, which is quite far up uh, north in England. And a lot of the reactors that were initially built for the production of corn, and you can see a big example here of the 60 meter towers from the 1970s, are from around the area. And what's very interesting about the production of the mycoprotein for corn is that it's made using an airlift reactor. Now this has a very typical design and if you will look at a previous video that I've done on types of bioreactors you will see that this is not very common. But it has certain advantages and in this particular case um, one of the things that is of big interest is that it's a very suitable for shear sensitive shells which is the case as you will see later on for what we use to produce mycoprotein um, but also it works relatively well with viscous cultures. Now the design is quite straightforward. Now, the main, main advantage of what you've got here is that you just have uh, gas kind of coming in and then it kind of comes down. And because of um, the velocity that you've got of the gas coming in, so different velocities, you get mixing. So it therefore really completely avoids mechanical mixing, uh, which wouldn't damage the cells. Um, but what you then do get is that you have it coming in, you see it's always kind of a bit wider at the top, which is a disengagement zone. You can have an external loop as well. Uh, and then you have a part where it kind of everything comes down again, which is called the downcomer. Uh, and the difference here is that in the downcomer, the cells would be without oxygen. So it's very crucial when you scale up the process, which is very straightforward, but that the length of the downcomer is not so high that the cells are without oxygen for too long. Now, now you've seen that typical design, so you see it's kind of relatively narrow and it's a bit wider at the top where you have the disengagement zone. Let's have a brief look at what kind of microorganisms are used for this. And this is a typical uh, type of fungi, and fungi have been commonly used for food. You probably all know this from mushrooms, which is the most common example, but also yeast that we use for, for baking is a type of fungi. And here you see that typical structure of what is actually used to produce mycoprotein because it has this kind of fibril like structure uh, that was thought to be better to give it like a similar texture to what meat would have. Um, and that was one of the reasons for picking it. But as you can imagine and you see kind of how how this looks, that this also makes the culture more viscous, which is definitely challenging in terms of the production. And finally enough, this uh, actually started in the 1960s, where people already started looking for a meat substitute. Um, so you can see all the research that went into it, because the product wasn't marketed until 85, uh, which is still a long time ago, if you think of it. And to put this into perspective, uh, to bring something to the market for human consumption, this was a 10 million word document which had to be approved by the FDA. Now, in the next slide, I will talk more about how they came to pick uh, what a strain they wanted to use. Uh, and that was selected over more than 3000 isolates. And the real things that were important there were, for instance, the protein and the toxin content, how fast it could grow, but also the morphology, because it's supposed to give it that typical texture that you have of meat. When it comes to the marketing of corn, people obviously know that it's a meat substitute, but also it's got a high protein content. And that is very important for, for instance, athletes or for healthy eating in general. And in the, the, the table on the right, you can see this is that the F atom. I find it's really difficult to pronounce. I'm not going to do that that much. That is used for the mycin protein production uh, in corn has got a much higher protein content than, for instance, as you see, chicken or other type of meat. So then looking back at how they actually came to the right strain to produce um, this corn, and here they, they had a whole process where they looked at over 3000 different isolates. And I mentioned before, they looked at the filament growth. Uh, they looked at, for instance, different colors. Um, they looked at obviously it didn't have to be like toxic and then at the amount of protein that it could produce. And that was kind of reduced to around 20 different strains. And this was then then tested on animals and also uh, on humans afterwards. And I think you will know how long it actually takes to bring all of these products to market.
Now, the funny thing is that even though they, they looked at over 3,000 isolates, the one that they went with in the end, which had the better growth, the highest protein content, actually came from the backyard of one of the employees. For the initial production of corn, it was found out because they had to dilute this quite a lot. So imagine you've seen this kind of filament type structure, so you can imagine this is a relatively viscous culture. Um, so the most economic process for when you work under high dilution rate was to have a continuous flow process compared to batch, where you have to have different batches every single time. And initially they started with a 300 litre stir tank, which then went when it was scaled up to the airlift reactors to 40,000. And with the picture you've seen went to 150,000 litres. And then you see these big towers uh, that I've showed you examples for in the beginning. So when you go through that scale up process, other things start to become important. So looking at a really small scale, for instance, the, the oxygen transport is very different. You also put relatively kind of less strain on the material that you have, so on the microorganisms. But you can imagine that your reactor is going to become longer and longer. And that also means that the length of this downcomer will become longer. So you have to consider that what's the maximum length that you can work with. And that's related to the time that the microorganisms are without oxygen. Now, in terms of control, there are different ways of how you can control bioreactors. Um, so you have like a chemostat to be the stat. Again, I've went through this in a previous video. Um, but the key thing here was based on that they moved to a different type of a measurement system. And if you measure something in line, you measure everything directly within the reactor, which is extremely challenging because you're going to have lots of different compounds in there and your fouling of your sensors is a big problem. So what you can do is that you have a small diverted stream uh, where you can do either online or at line measurements. And in at line measurements, it typically takes a little bit longer. So it can be like gas chromatography. But with online, it means that you divert a small stream, you get very, very quick measurements, so you can quickly adapt the process. And now they use uh, the control based on uh, the production of carbon dioxide, because if because it's online, you get very fast feedback. So it means that you're very uh, precisely able to control what's happening in your measurement system. I mentioned before that the selection pressure is something that's very important to consider. So what's going to happen when you have something, particularly on the con uh, continuous conditions where uh, you expose it to certain conditions and you culture it for somewhat longer, uh, what happens then is that you automatically form mutants. And these mutants tend to uh, grow faster so they can take over your culture. And the problem is obviously that these mutants might not uh, produce the product that you actually want. So there's different ways of how you could, for instance, combat that. Um, you can imagine that this becomes more and more of a problem when you start to do more of the scale up. So this was never so much a problem for the 300 uh, liter tank. But the key thing is that you need to look at the residence time in your production process and see how long this takes and how long you can uh, actually run these cultures without this becoming too much of a problem. This is not so much used in practice yet, but let's say if this was a particular problem in your process, uh, you could, for instance, make some small periodic changes to the environment to combat this. In the case of corn, they could also look at some wild type strains with different branching patterns, uh, which people might want to consider. Uh, but also you want to look at the morphologically stability. So there are certain cells that are more morphologically stable than others. So that now here you can see a little bit more about the actual production process because I've mainly been talking about the fermenter, so what happens in your airlift reactor, um, but then what do you need to do after all of that? So what kind of downstream processing have you got to do? So you can see the temperature is not that high, uh, which is common for when you work with these type of cultures. So it's only about 28 to 30 degrees. pH is around 6, but it needs to be controlled when you work with these microorganisms very precisely. And the specific growth rate is about four hours. Now they do this for several weeks, so up to six weeks. So you can imagine why uh, this uh, potentially having mutants might become a problem then. And when you do this, it's very important that you have regular testing uh, because this is going to be used for human con consumption. 
Um, so you need to monitor whether you have any contamination or, for instance, mycotoxins that might occur. But that's just the process of the reactor, okay? So you have your raw materials. You obviously need to make sure that there's sugar, so you fat the culture, a uh, very specific defined medium that you work with, and then you add uh, the fungi to it in order to make sure that you produce the mycoprotein. Once you have that, there's quite a few kind of steps that you need to go through uh, in order to get um, to the actual mycoprotein, which can be then shaped into corn. So what I've shown here is not the full process. Uh, this is kind of what you then end up with uh, when you mix it and you get the, the product, which you call essence. But then that still needs to be shaped in order to turn it into the actual products that you eat from the shelf. So this is mainly to get to the microprotein and then to order to kind of shape it then into the final products. There's a, a couple of steps that are, are quite important here. Um, so first of all, we need to reduce the RNA content of the biomass. Um, so this is just done by uh, some type of heat treatment, so up to about like 70 degrees. Um, and you then get around 2% solid content, roughly. Uh, which is not very much when you think of it. And so the step after that is that you need to centrifuge it to get it to a much higher content. Uh, so you have like a kind of an aqueous solution um, into which you can add some flavors. And we need to get to about 20% solid content in order to get it to the mycoprotein that we want. And before this is then transformed into products or shaped, you will have very extensive quality analysis in order to make sure that it's safe for human consumption. Um, so that's before all the other kind of processes take over. And before then, that micro when the microprotein is then approved, this is when you can start to add, uh, for instance, colors or flavors or other compounds to it. So next time when you eat corn, and I know I eat it quite regularly, think of all uh, the research that went into it using some very, very uh, bespoke bioreactor technology, in this case using airlift reactors. Um, so all the research that went into it, uh, so you would have seen people started in the 60s and didn't market it until the 1985. So more than 20 years of research and obviously still ongoing research to optimize the process and uh, using a simple fungi as an isolate from an employee's backyard. Now, what's so unique about this is this airlift reactor with a continuous system, which is very good for economic scale up. So for large scale production, as you would have seen, um, and they use some very uh, interesting control mechanisms using online monitoring to make sure that um, this, this food is safe for consumption. So you don't have for a formation of mutants and also that you avoid potential contaminants, which uh, might interfere with your food. So if you are interested in bioreactors, then have a look at our playlist where we've got more videos on similar topics.